Welcome friends to another r slash pro revenge video. Today we've got a crazy story about funeral benefits. But first a story from Mikey Bonbon bon 1988. Crazy Karen neighbor is pushed too far and pissing off the piggies. Last night I posted about my Karen neighbor and well last night she pushed too far. My girlfriend and I were outside on the front deck playing video games. I brought the TV out so we could play some games, have a beer and just enjoy the evening. It wasn't late, 7 p.m., about dusk. My girl and I are having a few rounds of Mario Kart 64, in my opinion the best one. When Karen gets home and marches her butt over to say, what do you think you're doing? She was referring to the TV on deck, the beer in hands, or the general enjoyment of life. I replied, just enjoying our evening. Karen told me to take all the crap and my who are inside. It's not the place for this crap. And that's when she finally pushed too far, and I snapped. I stood up and told her to shut her freaking mouth, get the freak off my property, or I'm going to drag her off. Karen laughed at me, saying I have no idea what's going on. Karen says she sees cars and men going into my home all day when I'm at work. Karen's not wrong. A lot of people stop by during the day to see me. She has the girlfriend's car and mine mixed up. She doesn't realize I'm basically working from home. I get even more pissed and walk to the stairs to confront her, and she waddles back to her house in a hurry. The cops show up 30 minutes later with a complaint. Today I went to the police station, and they gave me reason 7,894 why I hate them. They refused to do anything about her. They wouldn't take a report. Nothing. They said it's a personal matter. It's my problem. They told me to just stay inside if she doesn't like me on the deck because it's causing them problems. The only darn reason I chose this house was that beautiful front deck. I saw it as a perfect hangout for my friends and I. Well, today I had plans to take the bikes out with my crew and cruise down the highway. But because of all this, plans change. I called one of my buddies, Bruce. We call him Hot Dog. He's a hot dog vendor down in Toronto. Bruce got the word out about the change of plans. Now the revenge is a very simple thing to drive Karen crazy, piss the cops off, and just enjoy life. So I'm going to leave out some important information until we get to the point the cops arrive. Some information about my friends and I is we're all big burly men. And if it's at a biker, that's what we look like. Except for Frost, he's a short crap. My friends get to my place at about 1 p.m. You can hear them arrive. Six very big loud Harleys pull up in your drive. The entire house shakes. It's a thing of beauty. The crew dismounts and we start our day just having a grand old time on the front of my place. Karen eventually waddles her butt out of her house and we crank up the music. This time it was Barbie Girl. When she starts walking over to my home, we all just start booing her. Karen stops dead in her tracks, jaw almost hitting the ground and walks back into her home. We went back to enjoying our lives. Cops show up. Now it's time to describe what was actually going on. Well, the cops pull up and they step out. The look on their face, it was glorious. Picture this, seven big burly, most of us bearded, tattooed men, sitting shirtless in short shorts, sitting at a full-sized poker table. Yeah, I brought on my poker table. Playing cards with money on the table, smoking weed with a few beers. All perfectly legal, I checked the bylaws, as long as it's five feet away from the public sidewalk. Well, the cops were pissed off. They were getting annoyed being called to my house now on a daily basis. They want me to just do whatever Karen wants. After some words and some fast talk from my buddy Soup Boy, his last name is Campbell, he's a criminal defense lawyer and he works as a legal aid lawyer. The cops knew there was nothing they could do. I told the cops that if they don't do something about Karen, this is going to happen every single day until they tell her to stop being a witch. The cops went over to Karen's and she came outside, did some fake crying, pointing, and screaming at us big burly shirtless men. As she was doing that, we got extra mischievous and turned on the sprinkler. So now we have Karen screaming and crying to the cops, frustrated cops, and seven big burly tattooed shirtless men in short shorts prancing through a sprinkler. Now with classics from the Backstreet Boys playing on the stereo, the cops came back to talk to us to ask how long we were going to be. We said all day. When they went back to their car, we waved by and said, see you tomorrow. 
Karen closed all the curtains in her house and my friends just called taxis to go to their respective hotels. We're doing this all again tomorrow. Oh, I need to add something. My 70 year old neighbor on the other side came out at around 6 p.m. to see what was going on. I love this guy, he's an old school hippie. He sat down and had a joint with us. He gets harassed by Karen a lot and hopes we keep it up. He's going to come over tomorrow with a few joints of this homegrown weed, so score. Tomorrow is going to be fun. In a weird way, OP is almost saying that Karen has done something to bring him and their friends together and give them something fun to do and bond over. And you gotta admit, that is quite a sight. Some big burly men in short shorts dancing around to Backstreet Boys and Barbie Girl. Would you guys say that OP and their friends are going about this all the right way? That if the cops are not going to do anything about this situation when Karen's the one antagonizing the cops, then they need to keep this going and going until the cops finally do something about the true problem starter? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Stunning Island 7792 Golf Course had my number on their card. Something like 25 years ago, I had a landline in my bedroom. About three months after I got it, I started getting calls every day for the local golf course. I told them they had the wrong number and hung up. Some people would call back over and over insisting they were calling the number on the card. So I hopped on my bike and headed to the golf course, took one of their cards and discovered that they were indeed showing my number. I talked to the manager who insisted it was their number. I asked him to call it, but he refused, probably because he knew he'd end up talking to my parents. No resolution. So I went home, and for a couple years, I accepted every single reservation that called me. No matter what time they wanted, their reviews were not great, and most were complaints about the reservation process. Honestly, I've heard several variations of pretty much the exact same story here, and without fail, every single time, I'm astounded how these are operating running businesses that refuse to correct what number they're giving their customers. They're literally outright tanking potential return business. And I would think that the ones that go and take these cards or read the flyers and take down the numbers, those are the kind of customers you want to keep too because they reached out to you. Our next story is from a monkey in a lava lamp. Want to pretend you're a cop? Explain yourself to the real ones. This happened less than an hour ago, and my revenge hard on is yet to subside. It's late, over 9 p.m., and I work in the town next to where I live. So I got on the highway, two lanes each way separated by a patch of dirt in the middle. I merge on the right lane, and on the left, about half a car ahead of me, is a white Ford pickup. Important later. All of a sudden, the pickup starts merging onto my lane after a car behind flashed its lights to get them out of the fast lane. No blinker, no mirror checking, just moved like nothing was in the way. I brake and flash my lights, and the idiot brake checks me which did nothing since I was already braking because of that stupid maneuver, but took the opportunity to take the left lane and pass because I don't like driving behind jerks. I went back to the right lane after because my exit's coming, and that's when the idiot starts flashing blue lights on its grill behind me. For reference, flashing blue lights in my country are exclusively used by police forces, so they're not allowed anywhere on civilian vehicles with fines for impersonation of authority. Currently, the police pickups here are either Renaults or Toyotas, so I knew this wasn't any kind of police vehicle. Boards haven't been used in about 8 years, and this pickup was brand new. Here comes the revenge part. The exit I need to take to my town is getting renovated, so the two lanes merge into one. And at night, there's a police checkpoint to enforce the 30 km per hour speed limit because part of the highway doesn't have asphalt on it. So, I let go of the gas and prepare to slow down and get off the highway, and this moron is so fixated on my car that he doesn't notice the road works to the point that the two flashing lights are the only thing I see on my rear view mirror. Once we're on the single lane with those heavy orange cones, he has nowhere to go. So when I approach the first policeman directing traffic, I was already doing about 10 kilometers per hour, I lowered my window and directed him to the flashing lights on the pickup behind me. To which he thanked and proceeded to direct him to a clearing in front of the police car that was parked right ahead. There is very little that annoys police here more than an idiot trying to pass as a police officer. So that guy will get a ticket, lose a couple hours and probably be forced to rip out the lights and toss them before being allowed to continue. Honestly, I think it's fantastic to see any jerk like this go down. To be honest, I think it was only a matter of time before this guy got caught. 
Nowadays, and I don't know if it's the same wherever OP's at, but there seems like there's a good amount of undercover cars that drive around from time to time. It feels like a bit of an inevitability that at some point either somebody's going to rat them out, or they probably were going to end up flashing their fake blue lights at somebody that they really would have regretted flashing them at. And to be fair, although OP isn't a cop, there sure is a lot of regret for flashing them at OP in this situation. Our next story is from Jugsy1326. Peeping Lady Neighbor Gets Flashed I think this can go here, but if not, please let me know where to post it. So many moons ago, I moved into apartment, second floor. At the time, I was about 21, and I'm a guy. Nice place and decent part of town. Not long after I moved in, I noticed one of my second floor neighbors kept trying to look into my living room, through, around, any way possible past my curtains. I need to tell the layout of the apartment before I go any further. From front to back, I had a sunroom, fully inside the house but windows everywhere in this room that gets a lot of light, and faces the street and the neighbors across the street, church, and church parking lot where we all parked for street cleaning. Past the sunroom was the living room, and from there into the kitchen and then to the hallway, which leads to the bathroom and both bedrooms, master bedroom being the last room in the back that also leads to a porch for our apartment. So back to the story. I would always be nice to anyone and would chat here and there with most of the neighbor ladies, which were all nice. All except for one. She thought she was the queen of the street and had to know what everyone was doing at any time. She would constantly try to look through my windows to see what was going on in my apartment. She was about 65 years old or so. I would always see her craning her neck and head around to see into my apartment. I would try to ask her to stop, but she would never answer her door. Finally, after about six months of this, I decided to give her something to look at. So one morning, I got a shower, put on a robe, and went out to the sunroom. I always had the curtains closed at night and if I was undressed. I looked around the street and everywhere I could see to make sure no one was out and looking, but mainly wanted to make sure she was trying to look into my house. There, she was craning her neck trying to look through my closed curtains. Me, still having my robe around me, opened the curtains, saw her again trying to look into my apartment, opened my robe in full view in the middle of that window. I thought she had a heart attack since her face contorted and she grabbed her chest. Of course, her being a Karen, called the cops to try to get me arrested. Well, the cops show up at her place and then come over to mine. I had gotten dressed by this time, so I went downstairs to open the door and talk to them since I already knew what it was about. Cop 1 says, Yeah, we got a report of you standing naked in front of your window. I say, yeah, want to know why? I'll tell you. Ever since I moved into my apartment, that old hag had been darn near breaking her neck to try to look into my apartment every day. Me and my roommate have tried to ask her to stop, but she never answers her door. I finally got tired of her being a peeping Tom and gave her something to look at. And before you say anything, no one else was around when I did it. It's not my fault her 65 year old butt can't handle seeing what I have. Cobb 1 and 2 are laughing their butts off. Cobb 1 trying to catch his breath said, Okay, I'll go talk to her and tell her that she can actually be arrested for peeping and making a false report. Do you want to press charges? I say, nah, I think she learned her lesson, but if she didn't, she'll get it again. But next time it'll be a little more than she's gonna bargain for. Cop 1 and 2 laugh again and say, just make sure no one's around if you have to do that again. They left, walked across the street, and about 10 minutes later they left still laughing. She never tried to look into my house again. Yes, this actually happened and yes, I actually did that. I have nothing to hide and don't really care. If you want to break your neck to look into my house like you think you can, then don't be surprised at what you see and don't complain about what you see when I finally get tired of that and I flashy stark butt naked. I mean, if you're constantly peeping into somebody's window right into their living room essentially, it's kind of like an inevitability that you're gonna end up seeing something probably I guess you would classify as unsightly. I mean, I don't know, it depends what motivations this lady had for constantly trying to look in OP's house. Maybe next time it's time to introduce them to the helicopter. Our next story is by TV Anor. Not me, but my boss buys a guy out of his home. So I remodel and do property maintenance for a guy who owns a ton of property. Overall, he's actually a good guy and isn't your typical slumlord. He bought a second floor condo for his girlfriend, which we remodeled prior to her moving in. We made a big mistake with the plumbing and ruined the guy's bathroom ceiling downstairs. 
I get it, he was rightfully upset, but we did everything we could to make the situation whole, with no burden on him. The guy downstairs did everything in his power to make sure our work was heck. He would call the cops weekly for noise complaints, try to get the building inspectors involved to shut it down. He'd call the HOA, block our cars in with his cars, just so much unnecessary crap, and I've heard through the grapevine that he's just a miserable jerk in general. Toward the end of the renovation, I noticed he would play music so freaking loud for hours on end, and his car would be gone. No biggie, we didn't care while working, but when the girlfriend moved in, it never stopped. So now my boss's girlfriend is living here, and the neighbor's still being a jerk with his music all hours of the day and night. Probably a month after this, my boss contacts the guy downstairs as landlord and makes a very generous offer on their condo. Well, they happily accepted, and once the miserable guy downstairs was informed that my boss would be his new landlord, within the next 60 days, he promptly packed his crap and found another place to live. The main takeaway I have from this story is this dude had a lot of money. He bought his girlfriend a condo? Not like bought them a condo, no, bought his girlfriend a condo. And then somebody was being a huge pain in the butt, so what did they do? They just went and bought the place they lived. I wish I had even like a quarter of the money this guy had to just fling around. Just imagine having enough money where somebody's being so annoying that you're like, screw it, I'm just gonna buy the place they live in. Our next story is from Mikey Bonbon 1988 so my Karen neighbor is at her BS again, so I've been moved into my new house for a bit over a week. I have an entitled neighbor who I'm going to call Karen. Since moving in, Karen has been just that, a Karen. I just got my home gym set up. I have a garage that I'm using as a fully equipped home gym. Gotta get them gains. Today I had a knocking at my door. It wasn't Karen, it was the building inspector. The building inspector came equipped with pictures of my gym, all the cameras on my property, the complete outside of it, was kind of disgusting how many pictures this guy had. After a talk with him, there were no infractions at all. I had to check my cameras and, yep, you guessed it, there's Karen walking all over my property snapping pictures. Karen had the balls to go into my garage to take a picture. So yeah, I asked the building inspector about the laws with my floodlights, where I can point them. Needless to say, they're now pointing as far as they legally can at Karen's house. Enough to give her a nice blinding flash of light every time they turn on. To be extra petty, I went to Home Depot and bought some timers, so to be an extra petty jerk, they turn on overnight for 30 seconds every hour at the 30 minute mark. So 1.30, 2.30, 3.30, 4.30, screw you Karen. She came banging on my door this morning to scream about the lights. She also mentioned that I shouldn't have that equipment in my garage. You can't do business out of your house. Complete BS. And my gym is for me, not for anyone else. But she's scared that my gym's going to attract some unsavory characters. But seriously, Karen, it's a home gym, not a meth lab. We're gonna go over to OP's house to cook. Up some gains? Needless to say, I think it's safe to assume Karen doesn't do any kind of exercise because they can't fathom the concept of a home gym. Honestly, let alone the the guy that bought their girlfriend of condo, I wish I had the money to go equip myself with a home gym. Our next story is from Queen of Cockroaches. I screwed my mother's greedy family out of her funeral benefits. My late mother and my dad met when she was a nurse, and he was a medical student in the late 60s. They got married in 1973. I was born later that year. My mom's family always despised my dad, but not his money, because he wasn't Zulu and couldn't speak the language. My mom stayed home and raised my siblings and I. What they didn't know is that my parents had an agreement that she would stay home and raise us, but was studying. She ended up becoming an amazing student, and my dad only paid for her first year of her degree, and she had scholarships the rest of her academic career all the way to her PhD. She sadly died six months before defending her thesis. When my brother started school, my mother went back to work as a lecturer, but also started first translating books, then writing books. By the time I was in my mid-teens, she was out earning my dad four to one. We went to private schools, took lux holidays, wore nice clothes, lived in a big house. She and my dad drove a late model Mercedes or BMW every two years, and we went to university, which they paid for in full. She was always sending money back to her family, paying for their education, letting them stay in her rental properties, etc. 
In my country, there's things called funeral policies, where you pay a nominal amount monthly and insure someone and when they pass away, you can claim the funeral benefit to help with the funeral. A lot of these freeloaders had insured my mom and told us about it and were paying for the benefits with the money she gave them, ostensibly to help pay for her funeral when she passed away. The story... My mom passed away suddenly and unexpectedly from an asthma attack on a Tuesday at 63, and we duly informed everyone. They, mom's family, all lived 6 to 12 hours away by car. Strike one, they call asking for gas money to come to the funeral. Strike two, they arrive empty-handed and expect to be waited on hand and foot. They also never contributed even one red cent to her funeral. This is something that's done in my country. Strike three, I had two small babies. My sister was in the UK and struggling to get flights out because it was just after Easter and we wanted to wait until after she arrived to set a funeral date and other arrangements. Funeral was set for a Tuesday. They accused us of setting up the date so they couldn't attend because it wasn't a weekend. A funeral is usually held on weekends to allow family to travel and they needed to take leave. My dad reminded them that we all had to take leave. Strike four, my aunts ransacked my mom's room, which she shared with my dad while we were running around making arrangements and helped themselves to her clothes, shoes, and jewelry. They even stole her wedding rings. Strike five, my uncles and cousins got drunk on the day of the funeral and got into a fight and screwed each other up and my grieving dad had to stitch these jerks up. Strike six, they commented on the cost of her casket and tombstone. Yes, they were pricey, but my mom liked nice things and had put away enough money to pay for it herself. At this point, I was running on no sleep, grieving, and trying to pay attention to my babies, so I lost it. I grabbed a handful of coins and threw it at them, screaming they could have their contribution back. They hadn't made one. Not my best moment. They also commented on why we were using catering instead of cooking at home as was custom. This was my mother's wish. She always said she wanted a caterer so all of her family could attend her funeral instead of tending to the pots. Screw them. Strike seven, they asked for gas money to get back home. The revenge? Now to claim from the funeral policy, you had to produce a police certified death certificate. As they were weaseling their slimy ways out, they all, to a man, all 12 of them, aunts, uncles, and cousins, asked for copies of the death certificate. They had the program, ostensibly to get bereavement leave from their respective jobs. I gave them photocopies of the death certificate, just not certified. They all claimed to need certified copies for... 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 My dad and I blandly told them that for work, they don't need certified copies, just regular copies, and we sent them on their way. The fallout... None of those greedy freakers were able to ever claim from the policies because they couldn't get certified copies and they weren't able to get original death certificates because we never gave them copies of her ID needed to get an original certificate. Freak you, you greedy freakers. Puppy got rich selling her clothes and jewelry. Oh, and the tap of unending money shut down hard. I hadn't experienced anything quite on this scale, but I've definitely seen where a relative that maybe had enough stuff, maybe not like lots of money, but stuff, relatives come out of the woodworks to go and lay claim and take whatever they can. And honestly, depending on the family dynamics, it sadly can get really ugly between people just trying to grab up a dead relative's former belongings. Our next story is from Stan Santos, YT. Be careful what you throw out when you're fly tipping. Last year, we had a major fly tipping problem outside my workplace. I work out of a unit at a farm and a lot of stuff gets dumped outside our gate. But because we're literally in the middle of nowhere, the council don't want to know, so it's up to us to get rid of it. One day, I've gone into work and my boss was furious about the garbage that was dumped outside. While helping him load the truck, I discover something interesting an old box that was used for a parcel with a name and address on it. I keep it handy and continue cleaning. Afterwards, my boss asks me to take the truck and get rid of the rubbish at a recycle center. I say yes and leave, but instead of going to the plant, I headed to the address on the box and arrived at the house. I arrive at the house and see that nobody is in it, so I back up onto the driveway and press the tip button and unload all the rubbish all over his nice lawn. 
Afterwards, I grabbed the box from earlier and write in a black marker, I believe you dropped this, so I returned it for you, and left it outside his door. Don't know what happened afterwards, but we haven't had a single fly tipping problem ever since. I've learned two things about anonymity through petty crimes. One, if you're going to do anything involving money, don't do it using checks. And two, if you're going to go and dump your trash, at least make sure like your Amazon boxes don't have the labels on it that have literally your name and home address on them. Honestly, you probably want to take the whole label off of there. There's probably enough identifying info that if somebody did care, they'd probably be able to figure out who you are. Our next story is from Scottskid73. Tour guide shows herself up. This was pre-COVID. For context, I, 49-year-old male, am Scottish and live in central Scotland. My father wanted to go on a day out, and I suggested Falkland Palace in Fife. We agreed and drove over. It's a very beautiful village, very historic. I once did a reenactment event there, and it was good to actually get the chance to see what it looked like. Well, we go around the town and then pay to go into the palace itself. Now, the people working at the admission are very nice and have no objections to me taking pictures on my phone. So we headed up the stairs into the royal bedroom. I have the phone out and I'm happily snapping away when the guide upstairs suddenly roars at me. You can't take pictures here. These pictures are on loan from the queen. You could go to prison for that. If she had been nice about it, I'd have been more compliant. But it made the room go quiet and some of the tourists there looked embarrassed at this outburst. My dad and I go into the antechambers to look at the royal bedroom. As we're coming out and back into the bedroom, we hear the same guide saying something about this bed belonging to James II. I see my chance and go for it. Are you sure about that? I ask. James II was king of Scotland in the 15th century, but this bed dates from the late 17th century. Do you mean James VII and II? The look she gave me could have curdled milk. For added benefit, the tourists who had witnessed her earlier outburst were trying, and failing, to stop themselves from laughing. I love what OP did here because it's historically correct. This is a location in Scotland. The least the tour guide could do is have the correct person. Honestly, if I was one of those other tourists and I saw that go down, I'd feel unsure about anything this tour guide's saying, really. It could be like a fluff piece or some marginally inaccurate thing they've heard that they're just parroting. And our final story of the day is from Such Consequence 7239. Extended family finally get what they deserve. Backstory, my entire life, I've lived the shadows of my extended family. They were always quite wealthy and made me and my family feel terrible for living on a farm. And instead of dumping a load of money on a brand new car, we put our money back into the farm. A while ago I came out as gay to them and had gotten a lot of grief from them because of it. They spread rumors around our small town that didn't reflect positive things on my name. That was the turning point for me. I blocked all of my extended family and never made contact with them again. I moved away, became a nuclear engineer, and made quite a bit of money by doing so. I also married the man of my dreams and we've adopted three children since then. Revenge. A couple of years later, my great-grandma unfortunately passed away. And because of such an event, I was reunited with my extended family. Almost as soon as I arrived, I began seeing them everywhere. They had become financially unstable and were living like how I used to when I was a local. You would think that would be enough revenge, but it got better. They still tried to put me down by flexing whatever objects they had. But the thing is, I had it better. For example, my aunt downgraded to an apartment and tried to flex the pool she now had access to, stating, I mean, just look at this pool I can use whenever I want now. Do you have anything like that in place where you live now? I then promptly showed her my own in-ground pool with a water slide for the kid. I even said, yeah, my kids can go down that and swim whenever they want without having to worry about anyone else interrupting them while they play. She then finally shut her trap and I didn't hear a peep out of her for the rest of the night. Another thing that was pretty sweet was outlifting my cousin. You see, when we were about 16 years old, both of us got real into going to the gym and lifting. He was a very cut man, and because of this, his muscles would always show when he flexed them. He always made me feel little, and I gave up lifting shortly after because of it. But when I moved away, I picked it up again, and even got myself a personal trainer to help me progress. When I came back, he started back at it again. I finally said, well, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and let's have a little lift off per se. He agreed to it 
and even though he did look a lot stronger than I was, I outlifted him in every little event we did, including deadlift and bench by at least 100 pounds. Man, it felt so good to finally put these people back in their place. Honestly, I'm wondering how much of getting excommunicated from that family was a benefit for OP. Cause let's be real, that family sounds like a family who prides themselves on tearing down each other, thrives off of putting down others so they can feel better about themselves. You know, OP getting away from that probably just gave them all the room to be the best version of themselves they could. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy revenge story, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.